Hello, I'm Kevin O'Hearn, as Director of the Royal Ballet. I'm delighted to welcome you to this very special event. Today we're focusing on Sir Kenneth Macmillan's Romeo and Juliet, a ballet that was first premiered by the Royal Ballet in 1965 and has been performed many times on the Royal Opera House stage and on tours around the world. And we even performed it most recently at the O2, playing for thousands of people every night. This has been made possible by our partnership with the Coots, and we're eternally grateful for all their support over the years for the Royal Opera House and the Royal Ballet. Today's panel consists of Darcy Bussell, former ballerina of the Royal Ballet, Yasmin Nagdi, a principal dancer of the Royal Ballet today, Charlotte Macmillan, a multidisciplinary artist, and of course, the daughter of Kenneth Macmillan, and Kristen McNally, Royal Ballet character principal, but she will be hosting the evening and the discussion. So that's enough from me. So it's now over to Kristen. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Of course, we're missing the Opera House so much that we haven't been able to be there during this period. But we feel very fortunate to be able to be able to share this insight into the artistry that would normally be happening at the Opera House here with you today. So thank you very much. Um, so, in 1965, Kenneth Macmillan turned Shakespeare's heart-wrenching story of passionate young love into his ballet of Romeo and Juliet, and it's really been a masterpiece of the 20th century. It's been performed by the Royal Ballet more than 400 times since, and it continues to really enchant and move audiences today. I know it's really one of my favourites to perform. Here's a little trailer. Uh, to have a sneaky peek of Romeo and Juliet. So Charlotte, if I can come over to you first. I mean, this genius work of your father's is, it means so much to, to all of us. Um, can you tell us a little bit about where it was created within his choreographic career and what you feel is so quintessentially Macmillan about it? Hi Kristen. Um, well he was quite young at the time, I think he was in his early 30s and um, hadn't done a huge amount as yet. Um, and he followed his friend John Cranker uh, over to Stuttgart Ballet and had, had a look at what he was doing over there and he had done his own version of Romeo and Juliet and I think it gave him an idea to have a go himself. Um, and so in fact the, the balcony part de deux was the first bit of choreography that he started with uh, on Lynn Seymour and Christopher Gable for uh, a TV performance on Canadian television. So I think from however that performance went, obviously it was a big success. Um, he was invited to do it at the Royal Opera House. And it was a bit of a coup at the time because I believe that Frederick Ashton was supposed to be doing his own version that he had created about 10 years before. And once he'd seen this balcony part de deux, I think he decided not to, to revive it. Mm -hmm. So that's where, really where it started. And um, as you say, it's been done over 400 times by the Royal Ballet, but by countless other companies as well. Yeah. Um, we have this little fact that in eight press interviews last year with principals from all over, they refer to Macmillan's ballet always in regards to their favourite role. Now, Darcy, if I can come to you, what what was it or what is it about Kenneth's ability to, to storytell and create these fantastic roles to perform? Um, well, I, I mean, so many, so many things, but I think how he's able to connect his choreography with the music, how beautifully well they're gelled together. Because um, I think if you listen to Prokofiev's music, it, it is quite extraordinary how you feel the story through the sound. But then when you add his choreography, it just comes alive. But I think as a dancer to perform it, it's, it's because it's so real, so natural. Uh, and you're really human on that stage. You're not playing a princess or, you know, uh, a character that, uh, I don't know, it, it comes alive uh, on the stage. And to why it's so pleasurable, I think, because you can get so involved 
in the role, in acting the role, that you forget that there's even an audience watching you. You just get so involved, so absorbed in all the contact of all the different characters. It just feels so natural. Um, I think that's why it's so uh, fulfilling to perform. Yeah, and it is that because you think with Shakespeare's obviously wordy play and then it's transformed into this wordless art form of dance, but the characters really do come alive, don't yeah. they? Yeah. I, I just love that Kenneth never wanted us to have pretty positions. You know, when you fell out of a uh, this extraordinary lift or something, you'd be desperate and you'd be flat-footed you know, just looking at Romeo and it, you know, all of those moments, he was really, really uh, strong to make sure the connection was as real as possible. Even though the beautiful forms and shapes of the classical uh, choreography, but it was always very real. And all those moments of confrontation between the different families were so intense. And yeah, it was always very exciting to perform. Yeah, and every single character on that stage is a valued member. Oh, like yeah. you said, so you're yeah. looking around and everybody is connected to you. They're all so involved, yeah. yeah. Um, Yasmin, just before we come to, to you, we do have a little video of you in action as, as Juliet. We have a clip of the bedroom, pas de deux, um, from Act 3. So let's take a look at this first and then we'll, we'll come to you.
So that was Yasmin in action with her gorgeous Romeo, Matthew Ball. Uh, so Yasmin, if we, if we come to you, can you reflect on the role of Juliet as a dramatic opportunity for you and how it's been in your career so far? Dancing the role of Juliet for me was really a pinnacle moment in my career. I was given it as a soloist and it was my first full length ballet with the company. So I felt this huge responsibility to give the role full value as so many great ballerinas had danced it before me. And I'd watched so many great ballerinas do this from the sidelines. I've you know, done all of the roles, all of the court of ballet roles in this ballet as well. So to finally be given the opportunity to dance the role of Juliet was very, very it's hard to put into words, really incredible. And I love the journey she goes through. She starts as this young woman, very innocent, and then you know, she's love struck and torn. And then these two young lives are needlessly wasted. It's, it's so heartbreaking. And I think, as Darcy said, it's real people and real emotions. And I think that's why it resonates so, so much with, with our audience. Yeah, and you spoke a little bit about the being part of the company and other roles in the production. Did that help you? when you became Juliet, because you, you knew what the characters around you would Absolutely. be. Yeah. Absolutely, I think it really gives you such a great foundation to have done all those other roles and, and to watch Juliet from the wings and you know, dream of maybe one day doing it yourself and how you would play it. Maybe you, you see something that you really like someone does and then, or something that you think, oh, maybe I could put this flavor on it. So as an artist and, and a ballerina, it's so wonderful to finally have your opportunity to give it your mark, to put your stamp on the role. And, and I know that Macmillan really wanted something different every time. He didn't want a carbon copy. He, he really wanted you to, to have your own mark on it. And, and that artistic license is so important for, for growth. Yeah, and, and Darcy, you played Juliet throughout your career. How is that development with the character as you perform it through the years? Um, oh yes, Re really different. I think um, I, try, I was trying to work out how old, how old I was when I first did it and I was 23. So quite naive to the world. <laughs> um, and, and of course, you need more life experience and, and live and everything. And, and I think when I finished, uh, when I did my last performance, I, I'd had two children. So yeah, it had totally changed. I mean, you still want that freshness always. You know, you're always thinking towards your first audience, uh, all these things that go through your head about how, how you approach the role. But um, it is just keeping it young, you know, keeping it those first experiences, remembering those first experiences of love, the, the sensations on your back, you know, all the tingling sensations of meeting somebody for the first time, you know, um, and then the sadness when, when you're, you disappoint your parents and, you know, all those things you've been through life yourself, there's, there'll be plenty of them. And you just bring those all to the ballet. And, and it was fascinating as I grew up how I wanted to always bring something different to it in uh, a different interpretation. And that was never because I got bored. You could never, ever get bored of any of Kenneth's work. There was so much to it, you know, it's a marathon of a role. Um, but it was also what I enjoyed is working with different men. <laughs> so having different Romeos and I was quite lucky there. I had quite a few Romeos. And so I learned something different and they all give something differently to the role. So that makes you change and react differently. But it, yeah, it was always really exciting. Um, I just wanted to mention, you know, about people you've watched over the years do it. So when I was growing up, um, and I'd always watched the balcony pas de deux as, a, as a student in the wings. And then when I was in it, I, I was a uh, first uh, a harlot um, with, uh, with the Romeo Mercutio and Benvolio. And I remember seeing Gelsey Kirkland and just blown away because she, she's slightly, what do you call it? She's in her own little bubble anyway, but the way she moved across that stage and what Kenneth gave you was this amazing breath of the whole stage to travel. And she literally, as she'd run, I just remember her legs never touching the ground, literally, with that excitement of, oh, I'm going to see Romeo, right he's, he's calm, he's calm, you know, you know, all those wonderful things, you're just running across the stage. And, uh, you know, there's so many memories I have from different ballerinas that you constantly go, oh, just, a, I'd love a tiny bit of that, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing to hear like you talk about the, this human quality and you know it's really vital for, for I guess ballet as an art form to really reach 
audiences and m move with the times to, to keep it relevant. And Charlotte, just to you, it's, the production has been seen in lots of, of different ways. So we did it kind of at the O2 to a stadium audience. We've recently uh, made a film of it. Can you just talk about keeping that relevance and why you think Romeo and Juliet, I guess above all others for us at the Opera House, has been able to, to reach audiences continuously? Um, well, I think, you know, I mean, the number one genius is in Shakespeare's writing. And I think as a story, it, I've seen it in many different incarnations in plays and films and musicals and um, so many different interpretations. So that in itself is incredible. But then I think with my father's choreography, I think that just the fact that at such a young age and in the early 60s, he decided to do something that was less classically a virtuoso ballet in terms of you know the, the 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 set way i mean i don't have the terminology very very well but i think you know that the way ballet used to present itself so that people would take bows at the end of solos and pas de deux, he wanted to do away with all of that and he wanted to have a proper immersive experience and I think that's what's really surpassed with this particular ballet. I think it can be interpreted uh, within his ballet so many different ways, as Darcy said. I think, um, you know, it could almost be performed in a, in a black space and everyone would understand what's going on because there's so much, it's so rich with, with choreography, but not only that, the, the ability to interpret those roles. You know, I, I remember somebody saying, that they were jealous of, of the fact that choreography can interpret what words perhaps take pages and pages and pages. You can do it in a, a few steps. And I think particularly with Romeo and Juliet, it's incredible. You can, it, it portrays that entire play so beautifully and anybody can, I've seen it being performed to a Chinese audience and everyone was eating noodles as they were watching it and they were just as entertained as people in America or wherever and you know so it's it's um yeah I think it will hopefully be performed for a very long time to come and enjoy Absolutely. like you say it's, it is universal in, in that wonderful sense um we'll come to passing on the choreography in a little moment with uh, Darcy and Yasmin, because everything is notated in this Benish notation, almost like a music score. So every step of when it was first choreographed would have been noted down so it can be passed on through the generations. But I know from myself as I have choreographed things and I know as, as you maybe move into a different space or you constantly want to adapt or tweak things but you know the choreographer is is there to do that and obviously Kenneth's not here but I know that yourself and your mum are very open to allowing Romeo and Juliet to have worked in those different spaces is that something you knew that your your dad would have would have done would have been wanting to be open to to moving it along yeah I mean I think I think what's evident and what's happened since his death is that um the work doesn't change the choreography's there he was a hu huge, um, he's hugely supported Benish notation and the ability to write everything down on paper. And he saw the benefits of recording things by video, but what he didn't want people to do is watch a video performance and carbon copy it. He wanted to give the opportunity for each dancer to, um, to investigate the role themselves. Um, and I think as long as the choreography is respected and is there and is taught by the people who know it and understand it, then it does have the opportunity to breathe. And I think, um, you know, just like the words of Shakespeare, we, you can see it interpreted in so many refreshing ways. Um, I once saw a production at the National Theatre of Midsummer Night's Dream and it was performed in a circle of mud and that was back in the 1980s, I think. <laughs> Puck was a, a contortionist who hung from the ceiling, but the words made sense still. And I like to think that choreography, if it's respected and it's passed on by the right people, and I, and I, and I sort of put an emphasis on that because I, I think it's really important it's taught by people who experienced it themselves. Um, that's where you'll never lose um, the art form, you know. Yeah. 
and and also keep it alive. You know, it's really important nowadays. We're all missing the theatre so much, and it's it's wonderful it is to be able to see it being live and people being able to watch it all, all corners of the globe. There's nothing like seeing it in live theatre. It's just magical. It's it's so energising. And I just really hope we can all get back into our seats again and watch watch these amazing works. It's it's vital. Absolutely well. Well said. <laughs> Um, so speaking about passing on the choreography Darcy if we come to you because now you yourself rehearse the dances you've rehearsed Yasmin we'll see a little clip of you both in action in a second but it's about as Charlotte was mentioning finding that room within the choreography to make it work for lots of different dancers can you talk about how how it's taught how it's passed on um yeah I mean you know everything is passed on. It, you, can't, you can't, as Charlotte said, you can't just rely on video, you can't just rely on notation. You need those people that were there in that space and all those little tiny, I suppose, uh, we should say nuggets of, of, of magic are, are constantly passed on, but also to show that there is always room. Um, I mean, I was a tall dancer coming into a role, um, you know, played by you know, a 14 year old. And, and so, you know, you, you learn tips about how to change and become that person. And then you're looking at a new dancer and, uh, and their talent and, and seeing what they have to give to that role or how they've got to adapt and change for it. Um, and, and it's just giving them tiny little suggestions because when we were so fortunate, the company is full of beautiful talent. And, and, and so the delivery of the choreography is obviously done exceptionally, but it's the narrative and how you tell the story through the music, um, all those amazing pauses, you know, the silent moments are probably some of the most exciting that Kenneth did, you know, just sitting on the edge of the bed. Um, that I find just extraordinary where everybody expects you've got to dance, you've got to move, you've got to, you know, we've got to feel something, but no, the stillness is probably the most exciting bit. So there's all these tiny little things and it's usually just phrasing, it's a look, it's a, you know, because the steps are often done stunningly. Um, it's just, pacing it and how you build through the role and how it, you grow through those each act and how you come to the end. And it's just making sure they always keep looking back at where they've started in the ballet to where they finished. But, you know, I, I learn as I, as I coach at the same time, because as a dancer, I felt very different. And then as a coach, I suddenly feel different again about the role. It's really interesting when you come back and you look at it several times again. Because when you're dancing it and feeling it, I don't know. It, it's it's everybody has a different view, which is it's which is perfect in a way. It's brilliant. Yeah, we've got another little clip now, and it's of you, Darcy, and Yasmin in the studio, and you're rehearsing together with former principal and repetitor Leslie Collier. So let's have a quick look at this. Yasmin, you're just about to start rehearsals for Romeo and Juliet. What do you think of first when you come into the studio? I think with a role like Romeo and Juliet, um, it's it's not crazy technical, you know, as opposed to things like Swan Lake or Sleeping Beauty. So you haven't got the anxiety of, I need to make sure my balances are absolutely, you know, spotless. I need to make sure my foites are really up and running. But with Juliet, the importance is really the storytelling. Let's do the balcony then. Should we go for Matthew running on? You've got Leslie Collier as your coach. Yes. Um, how do you draw on her experience? Because of course she's done this role when Kenneth was around exactly. as well, yeah. gosh, for years, and with many, many different Romeos. Leslie has such a world of knowledge, you know, and, and to know that she's also worked with Kenneth McMillan is incredible. It's like a swoon. We don't want to lose you round the back of him. You have to see him. That's what makes you swoon. Yeah. Yes. 
Leslie was really present in my growing up as a child. I used to watch her on, on videotapes back in the day. Um, so to be coached by her now is so, so inspiring. Um, and she has so much to give. She knows exactly what to look for. If there's a look that's in the wrong place or a foot that's in the wrong place, she sees everything. And it's great to have such confidence in the coach that you're working with. Now here, keep your arms up. Yes, okay, good. Yes. So make sure you go, yada, yada, dum, because it's Leslie, to just go. watching that rehearsal and, and trying to get little bits out of them, what are you really trying to build with their technique? Well, not so much with their technique, because they both have marvellous technique. Uh, the feel of dancing the ballet, dancing the story. Mm. That's what I'm big on the story. I love the play. So I have to be on my game. So I have to know my lines. And that helps me help them. The minute you bring the arm down, you've lost that feeling of happiness coming out of... I have wonderful visions of you, Leslie, doing Juliet. Oh, my gosh. And it is exactly as you say. They do get preoccupied with trying to produce everything beautifully technically. But actually, there's these links, yes. these beautiful linking yes. from one move to the next. It is all about the links and almost not seeing the steps. Mm -hmm. And certainly, you don't want to see the technique. It's got to be there for them so they can be free. OK, 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 OK. okay. Not noticing that footwork is marvellous. <laughs> I'm really happy with that because then I'm looking at the, the relationship. Yeah. It's the one thing Kenneth <laughs> screamed at Oh, he hated it. He, he hated, hated it. any posing. He hated it. Yeah. He'd prefer if you went like that. Yeah. He'd much prefer that <laughs> than you go. Yeah. They're a very young couple. When they are that raw to a role, how do you build their confidence? You're right. It's raw. And they are so willing because of that. So you feel like you really can have your say on it. <laughs> Eventually, I want it to be their performance. But I, I love them, you know? And they need to be loved. They need to be encouraged to be free. So, Yasmin, can you... Talk to us a little bit about the moment that you see your name up on the casting as Juliet to the getting to the stage. What is that process? It's really, the only way I can explain it is really magical. It's a magical feeling because you've had all this time of kind of dreaming of doing this role and then to finally see your name up on the casting. Um, you know, I thought, oh, maybe when dancers get cast in a role, you get taken into the office and the director tells you that you'll be doing a role and there's kind of that kind of feeling surrounding it. But I found out that I was doing Juliet. Uh, we were doing a stage call of a of, of ballet that we were doing the previous season. And Matthew Ball was sitting in front of me and he was going through his emails on his phone and he turned around and he showed me his phone with the casting. And I saw his name as Romeo and, and I gave him back the phone. And I said, oh my God, congratulations, you're doing Romeo. That's amazing. And he said, Yasmin, look who's doing Juliet. And I looked back at the phone and there I saw my name and I just couldn't believe it. It was so exciting. And I think all these emotions are just so heightened because you just think, oh my gosh, I want to do this with the character and though I get to do my favorite moment and I get to do this and this and oh, the dime scene and how you, you start mapping out how you're going to do, um, how you're going to interpret the, the ballet. And, and I just, I wanted to get started straight away. Um, so I just, you know, the coffee of score is amazing. I would just plug that in in the evenings and listen to it on the tube going to work. And, and then of course, close to the time, I want to go over the Shakespeare um, script and, and, and then watch the Zeffirelli version of Romeo and Juliet, which is so beautiful with Olivia Hussey. And you just, it's doing the research is so beautiful and it gives you such a lovely foundation to build the character that you then want to create on stage. And the process is so wonderful because for me, I always like to start with, with the technical foundation, getting the steps in my head, in my body, in my muscles, get, get that muscle memory, the so-called muscle memory of the steps, and then layering on the character and, and gradually letting go a little bit more and trusting yourself. And, and then when you go on stage, I, the thing that I love to feel is I love to feel so relaxed. And I tell myself, look, you've done the work, you've done the rehearsal, now it's time to let go. Trust that your body will do it for you and be in the story. And I think that's something that's so beautiful with, with Romeo and Juliet and a lot of Macmillan's ballets 
is that you are human, you are, it's real, it's raw, and it's there and then, it's happening there and then in the moment. And that's what's so, so special. And when the curtains come down, it's often a really difficult reality to face because you've lived this story, you've been this character, and all of a sudden it comes to an end. And you're faced with people congratulating you, and then you're faced with going back to your changing room and, and taking off the character that you've just been. And then you're greeted with people congratulating you, and you're just still on an adrenaline high. And then all of a sudden you're sat in the tube going back to your everyday life and it's it's such a surreal jump um, so that's quite an interesting journey that you go through yeah absolutely and when you're in rehearsals as I, I guess especially for a role like Juliet you're not until the very end stages surrounded by a full company to do the full ballet so do you often you'll just rehearse it in in sections maybe out of order and Exactly. It, it feels amazing then t to build that journey. You don't often have the full journey until maybe you're on stage. Absolutely. And it's such an electric feeling when you're then faced with your colleagues that are all kind of egging you on and they're there, the, the story comes to life. And especially when you step on stage and you've got the lights, you hear the orchestra, you, you've got the costumes, it becomes so real. And, and those are all the layers that go into making these, these ballets come to life. Going from the kind of the skeleton, the bare bones and, and working on the nitty gritties in the studio to then layering everything on top and then comes the makeup and the audience. And it's a beautiful process. Yeah, and Darcy, you're now involved with that process you know since your retirement from the stage you are now coaching lots of the royal ballet dancers you do nutcracker sleeping beauty and romeo and juliet how is that process for you and what is is your aim to pass on to the dancers um i suppose just remembering what kenneth said to me uh a lot of that and 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 just the coaches I had that worked intensely with Kenneth and, and keeping it, as Charlotte said, alive constantly and, and keeping it new and fresh every time. And it, it, it's really, for me, it's about looking at as a whole, as a, as a coach, as I said, from beginning to end, when I come into a studio and the dancers are so accomplished with the movements and, um, the technical side especially, uh, that then you just want to sort of, as, as Yasmin said, kind of take some of the layers away and just look at the narrative and how she grows up during this ballet. Um, um, and, and that's really what I, I, I try and focus on a lot is the narrative. I mean, there, there are honestly, you know, I don't know, when I used to play the role, I, it wasn't for the girl technically that difficult. In, in a lot of Kenneth's works, you know, they're really, really hard. And this was one of those roles where you could, you could get so involved in it because you didn't have to worry so much about timing or, or technical difficulties or uh, you know, stamina, especially, you know, you, you didn't get that out of breath. Um, it wasn't a killer on the, on the body as a whole. And so, so it was such a pleasure to play something so different where you could get so involved in the drama and being the actress. And, and I think that's a really important part to focus on, on, on how you interpret it. And I'm constantly thinking about who I'm coaching and how they're looking at those views, of how to interpret the role. Yeah, I mean, I obviously would have loved to have been in a room with Kenneth and Darcy, you had that opportunity. I know you've spoken about special memories, you know, what, have you got any of, more of those in your head and how do you feel his work developed you as an, as an artist? Um, well, Kenneth was my main uh, object of how I even got through the company at all. I think he, he gave me that confidence and that power to believe in myself as, as a tall uh, athletic dancer. So um, I remember when I came to the role, Anthony Dow, very, uh, and I've said this many a time, so if he's listening, it's okay. He didn't believe that the role was going to suit me at all. And, and he said, well, Kenneth does, so that's okay. You know? <laughs> and, and it was, I, I had such pleasure in, in trying to, I suppose, convince, especially Anthony, who I admired so much, that I could make this my role, that I could really become that person and be that young, uh, 
kind of frail love, you know, even though she's fiery at times, but you know how naive she is to it all. Um, and, and I really was excited about trying to attempt it. Um, but Kenneth, I don't know, he, he was interesting because often not a lot of expression. So you'd be in that studio with him and he'd let you, you know, run yourself flat. You'd be exhausted, you'd be on your hands and knees and he'd go, no, I don't like that. And you go, oh, Lord gosh, what can I do? What can I do now? And then you twist it the other way. You go, no, 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 stop twisting, do a turn. And, you know, they're just all these things. But so you're constantly moving. I never stopped moving to try and just trigger an engagement with him and go, ah, oh, that's the bit I like, you know. <laughs> so I was so lucky because by the time I came to do Romeo and Juliet, I actually had two ballets created with Kenneth. Um, so I, I got to know his process really well, um, even though it was at the end of his career and, and everybody said how, how much he had changed also. But uh, at least I had that opportunity to work with him on two creative works before I came to Juliet. So, and as Yasmin said, you know, he always wanted you to give something different. He didn't want you ever to imitate any of the other ballerinas in the past, you know, and they, you know, they, they all had something different to give. And so you're constantly going, okay, but of course you are going to be different because you're, <laughs> you're a different human being. Your, your body's different physically. You're, you move different as, as the years go on. So it will constantly keep adapting, which is always really exciting to watch. I, I love now coaching and, and seeing how dancers just give different, you know, values and energies. And uh, yeah, it's really lovely to see how they play with it. Well, it, it, yeah, it's great, as you say, because you can, you can watch, you know, we performed it over 400 times. You could watch it those 400 times and every time will be different. You're noticing different things, which is, you know. Yeah. It, it's, it's so exciting. I mean, it's, it's just, it's a wonderful sponge of masses of material. And, and as you said, the characters, it's, it, as a whole, you know, you work as an individual all the time. Uh, as a principle, but when you come together, then you see it come alive with all those characters, and it, it's just it's a really spectacular ballet to perform and, and to watch over and over again. Never get bored of it. <laughs> and you know, Charlotte, just coming to you, have you got what memories stick in your head of when your dad was creating and what he wanted for this amazing art form? Um, well, like Darcy said. I laughed a lot when she said there wasn't much expression. I, 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 I never really, I, I, twice I got to see him actually choreograph in, in a studio. The rest of the time it was always a very private affair and I was never involved. I was too young anyway. Um, but I got to see him create a bit of um, Winter Dreams and I was there in, in the studio for a couple of perform, uh, rehearsals then. But... All I know really is that he was completely and utterly obsessed with whatever he was doing at the time. And it was all encompassing and it came home with him and um, he listened to the music incessantly and he would read about it. And what I find so fascinating about the way he worked um, uh, as an artist, and it could be any art form he was doing, was that he wasn't afraid to scrap something if it wasn't working. And I think that's really an amazing quality to have for any art, anyone who creates anything, no matter whether you're professional or an amateur watercolorist, never be afraid to look at what you're doing and, and think, well, if it's not working, I'll start again. Because we can all be very proud of what we create. But if you push it a bit further, you might be surprised with what comes out of yourself. And I think that's what I've always found fascinating about him is that he could work for weeks on end on a particular ballet and at the last minute just go, no, no, it doesn't work. And, um, you know, and that's what, what sort of lasts for me. I mean, I, I find it very difficult for myself to do that with my own work, but I think um, if you become obsessed enough about one thing that you're doing, you can't, you, you have to constantly challenge yourself. And I think that's the key. Um, and, and that's what really kind of comes down through the dancers when they have the role is that it's, they're constantly questioning their position within the ballet in terms of how they interpret it, how, what, like Darcy just said, is how they can bring something different to the role, you know, and, and that's what makes it fresh.
and it's it's it's, it's really interesting i think it's um something we can all learn from absolutely and that seems like a perfect way for our our chat to to end up because i know we've got lots of questions from the audience if we can now go to them um so let's have a little look at what the audience want to ask rebecca has said that my daughter is 11 and an aspiring ballet dancer so thank you very much for this what a treat she says i met dame darcy last year at london children's ballet gala and was dressed as a snowflake and greeted her at the entrance it was a dream come true i think yasmin is a beautiful dancer and i've watched her lots of times I would like to ask both Dame Darcy and Yasmin, what was the best piece of advice that you were ever given as young dancers? Yasmin. Yes, Yasmin. Who <laughs> <Good> starts? <laughs> I think the best piece of advice I was given was to trust myself. And although that might seem a little bit crazy, I think dancers are known to constantly question and constantly strive for better and you know unless you're pushing yourself to do so you're going to stop growing so we're constantly unhappy with what we're producing and we always want to improve and do better and we're often never really satisfied with a performance um, and i think when i was told to really trust in my ability and i was given that trust by gaining stock the then director of the royal ballet school I was doing a competition called Young British Dancer of the Year and was up against amazing, amazing dancers. And when I felt that she, she trusted me to, to do well in this competition, I felt this sense of lightness and relief. And I was fortunate to, to win first place in that competition. And that was a real changing turning point for me in, in my student life to, to believe in my ability and then have that positive trajectory. Darcy? Um, I was told to fall. <laughs> um, it, it's funny, you met lots of wonderful teachers over the years. And uh, a teacher said to me, if, if you're not prepared to fall over, you are not going to really understand how, what you're made of, what you can achieve. And, and that was really interesting because you're constantly having to be on balance and I can, you know, I can turn, I can do all these things. And I've got to keep practicing that. But she said, no, you've got to fall. And because you want to know that you can push it that little bit further, you can, you know, be off balance and then change direction and all things like that. But if you're not prepared to fall, you're never going to feel that. And I, I thought, wow, I'd never imagined, you know, thought of it that way. But it did make you more fearless because suddenly if you knew you were going to be on the floor <laughs> the next minute, you know, this is where you do it. You do it in the studio. Obviously, you don't want to do it on the stage. But... To do it in the studio and to be prepared to fall was a really helpful sort of knowledge to understand my strengths and my weaknesses. And uh, yeah, I, it was kind of made it more interesting and more challenging. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even for us, it's nice to, to have that in your mind because the studio is for that time, isn't it? As you say, to, to push yourselves to find your limits. So then make, make the mistakes there. Yeah, there. <laughs> all the time in the studio. Yeah. Um, we have a question from David and this is to Dame Darcy. Um, David has said that he's actually performed with you on a few occasions and his all-time favourite, uh, he's a singer and his all-time favourite was with you in Ashton's Song of the Earth and it was your final performance with the Royal Ballet. And he said, as a singer, we have the words and music to which we add our own personal interpretation, creating colors and textures that bring the words and music to life. As a dancer, you work with notation of each move or step and its dynamic intensity. So my real question is to what degree can you put your own interp interpretation into a role that you're performing and what does that entail? Wow. Key, but yeah. wow that's oh. <laughs> there's a second part to this question as well so oh gosh wish i wait for that one <laughs> um well i think you know i think yasmin will say and charlotte will say you know every performance is different you know as as, as you 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 have your musicality you have your steps uh you have the different partners you work with um everybody uh will give something different to you each show that's what's so exciting about performing live is that it will always feel slightly different and 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 
it, it's difficult to sense. But for me, I suppose one example was doing Song of the Earth, Sir Kenneth McMillan's Song of the Earth, where you have two opera singers on the stage, is the atmosphere. So without that atmosphere, you don't perform as well, I don't believe. It, it creates this extraordinary, um, I don't know, it's like the air is thick around you. It, it's, it's full and alive. It's like all your senses come alive and you perform differently with different energy on that stage. And that can be the music, it can be the, even the audience, how, how excited they are to see that performance or, or you know, it's, it's brand new and, and they don't know, or it's something they know really well. And, and they all, everybody gives off different energies and you feel that when you're on stage. And that often makes you just interpret the role differently. And so from a Monday performance to a Saturday performance, it can make me all feel so different because of those different, um, you know, those different energies, is, or is it the ions or something? <laughs> but it's the atmosphere that's created by those different individuals on that stage with you that make you interpret something differently. Yeah, and I guess that's part of the magic of, of being a performer and having... It's a living art. We yeah. are so excited. I mean, I'm, I'm so excited to be part of a living art. It's brilliant. Uh, the second part to the question, was how do you conserve the energy in an intensive rehearsal period prior to that performance? He's saying as a singer, we usually mark the vocal line down an octave or sing in half voice. Does anything that happen like that as a dancer? Um, yes, of course it happens. I mean, but there is um, a period where you really have to go 100% all the time because until you get on that stage, you actually going to really understand how exhausting or the stamina that actually is needed to get through a three hour ballet or something. Um, but of course, you know, maybe two days before you notch back, because I think we've also understood by sports medicine that, you know, to keep the muscles feeling fresh and alert and, and supple and all those things, um, you know, there are stages and it's different for everybody, um, but it's like, you must never have a massage on the day of a show. <laughs> because oh well and again some people would say the opposite but for me that made my muscles feel all kind of squidgy and not alert or you know to react quickly um but um yeah it, it, I suppose it's different for everybody but there are a couple of days where you wouldn't run the whole ballet in those rehearsals uh you just take sections and I've done this with lovely Yasmin in in um Aurora which is such a difficult role and and very difficult to pace before you have your opening night and um i remember many times uh you know not always getting it right and going oh i did too much that week and and there was other ballets i was performing and they got in the way and i could have felt fresher and all these sort of things and it, it is a balance and it's only experience to find these things out yeah do you have anything to add to that yasmin of, of your experience of that yeah, I mean, sort of carrying on with what Darcy said about the sports medicine, I think it's really wonderful and important to have that involvement in our knowledge of how the body works and how to perform at optimum levels. Um, and I think, especially as a student and a young company member, I was someone that I thought I must do it full out every single time because if I mark something, you put that in your muscle memory and then maybe next time it doesn't go as well. And I've had instances where it's a complete mental game where I've thought, okay, let me mark this section because this is what really ties me out as I have a performance tomorrow. And then in the actual performance, that bit doesn't go as well because I doubt. Because in my head, I've said, oh, you marked it yesterday. Maybe it's not going to be as good. And then that exactly happens. So there's so much that goes on in your head. And we've also got amazing support with psychologists where you can do things like visualize the performance where it's proven to be really, really uh, efficient in your preparation before a performance instead of tiring out your body and doing everything uh, full out 100% every time. So it's really great to have that involvement in our, in our knowledge of, of dance and, and performance. Yeah, absolutely. Just adding to that, Kristen, you, you often, um, when you're really tired, sometimes do your best shows. And it's because you're not trying too hard, you know, all, all, all these different things. Um, so it's not always predictable. <laughs> but, uh, you know, because it's how, you know, you're sensing something different on that stage that makes 
you come alive or have suddenly pull out energy from nowhere as well. <laughs> um, we have one from a question from Ian. He said he was delighted to be able to watch Friday's streaming of Romeo and Juliet. Matthew and Yasmin were visibly emotionally drained at the curtain call after the last death scene. And that is unusual in ballet. He said, and how do you as a dancer manage that emotion, that journey that you've, you've just gone through on stage? Well, I mean, because these Macmillan ballets have to be real, you have to live the story, you have to be the character, you can't just layer it on top, you have to really be feeling what you're going through. And, and that is definitely why we both felt so drained. And I think all dancers feel quite drained after emotional performances. Things like Myling, for example, things like ballet, like on Yegin, where you're real people going through real emotions. And it is draining. You tap in to the emotion that you would go through in real life. And I think it's, it's such an emotional outlet. It feels incredible at the end to just allow your body to feel that drained. And, and that's what gets difficult when the curtain comes down and all of a sudden you're not living that story anymore. You're not that person. And I think it takes a few hours to come down and, and to get out of that, that story that you've just been living. So that, that would be how I would explain the emotionally drained feeling at the end of that ballet is because, you know, you've just seen your true love die, you know, and then you've just killed yourself to, to be with him in, in hopefully a life afterwards. And it's, it's so, so heart-wrenching and also the music is so emotional that it's it's draining in itself you know when when Juliet has that scream it just it sends shivers down my spine and that hearing that music and and that's what leads you to feeling that emotionally drained yeah so you do have to allow yourself I guess just time afterwards to to, to become Yasmin again to absolutely yeah because you've really as a dancer and an artist you've opened your soul to this and I think that's why we're so vulnerable um, in those moments and I think that is what is so special about this this art form is that you can allow yourself to be vulnerable and you can open your soul um, to your stage and I think that's when it really radiates to the audience um, so it's beautiful that we can tap into that yeah I think that's what I I guess I'm missing a lot is that you, as you say, you do open yourself up and you go on these incredible journeys through dance and that in normal life you don't do that. And so it's like I'm missing going through all those emotions and everything that it brings on stage to now. Um, so uh, another question from Andrew saying, Darcy, you were announced for this event as the most outstanding artist of your generation. Who would you say is the most outstanding male dancer of your generation? Oh, oh gosh. Um, well, I think it, oh, that's very difficult. Um, well, a lot of the generations slightly overlap. <laughs> I, I suppose um, Carlos Acosta is probably one of those extraordinary uh, people and, and it, yes, I, I suppose something like that. But it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, I, I came across and I, I danced with Russians to um, Americans to, and they all have something different to give at that time. But I suppose significantly, Carlos. He's a bit younger than me, but yeah. yeah but there's many. There's many more. I have a list, but he comes up the top. <laughs> Charlotte, is it amazing for you when you watch as an audience member to see those different partnerships every time performing these ballets? Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, sometimes you can really feel that there's something that a two dancers haven't felt about each other before. You know, it's quite tangible. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. I've seen, and I've seen so many different people of all different ages perform it, like realistically. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's amazing. I, I I love the variation. It's fantastic. It, it, you say it. You know, you put two human. As soon as a different human being is, is stood in front of you, you nat you naturally are going to just feel different, aren't you? So it, it makes for for a great and different performance every every time. Um, I'm afraid that is all we've got time for. It's been so amazing to to speak to you all and and get the insight into, I guess, not only Romeo and Juliet, but Sir Kenneth MacMillan's incredible works and how it's all affected you as artists and 
it's yeah it's been a real pleasure and i hope that everybody watching has enjoyed this and it's been insightful how fantastic was that a huge thanks to the panel dame darcy bustle yasmin nagdi charlotte mcmillan and Kristen mcnally for leading the discussion huge thanks to you for watching it at home and also to coots for the amazing partnership we have with them and making today possible. It's so interesting to hear what the dancers and Charlotte Macmillan have to say about Romeo and Juliet, this ballet that's so beloved by the Royal Ballet. And I can't wait for the day when you can walk through the doors of the Royal Opera House and watch it live on stage. But until then, take care and thank you again for watching.